I start most of these presentations now in kind of an odd way. Uh, I'm a five-year cancer survivor, and I use this opportunity to remind a few people in this audience that prevention saves lives. Uh, five years ago, um, I was diagnosed with stage three colon cancer. I had put off my colonoscopy for almost a decade, argued with my wife almost every day about it. Uh, she is a registered nurse, uh, basically it saved my life, I'm here. So I'm grateful for every day I get up. I'm grateful right at this moment for you, the time we're gonna spend together, and the decision that you made to actually come and listen to some things this morning. So thank you for doing that. And again, if you're putting off any diagnostic treatments, uh, let's get it done. So message, message from that point uh, forward. Three years ago, I stood almost in the exact same spot. And we were trying to figure out three years ago, um, first week in March, was that true? Last week in February. Last week of February. Uh, I think we shut the place down like a week later. We were trying to determine whether this was gonna be a super spreader event or not. <laughs> hey, did you meet so-and-so at the FOCO uh, session? And how are you feeling? <laughs> <laughs> so what I wanna do today is I wanna bring three things to you. I know your time's valuable, but uh, my co-founder Jamie Noel and I have been on a decade-long adventure. I'm coming to you mostly today not as a consultant, uh, not as an expert, I've only run three businesses, but truly as a kind of a messenger, a bit of a reporter of a multi-year study it combined with the Gallup organization on what is keeping more businesses from getting into the early little markets. So let me give you some facts that go right back to the presentation that we just heard. There are roughly 30 million firms registered as corporations in the United States. Only six million of those firms have more than five employees. That includes all firms. Google, the big ones, and all of us little ones, there's only so many firms that are there. So what happens in this United States is something that's a little interesting right now. How many people have been paying attention to job growth in the last 45 days, just by show of hands? We set a 50-year record in job growth in the United States. Has anybody else been paying attention to what's going on? Yeah, there's half of it that's on my <laughs> Well. A big part of it was that the large corporations were waiting for their opportunity to let people go. The great big companies, right while we were hiring, were letting people go. You represent those people in this room, and I think it's probably 100% of you, the future of the United States relative to job growth. So, what I want to bring to you today is a little bit of a research project that really speaks to you, the firm that you're trying to build, the challenges that you have, and what you could do to actually grow predictably. That's number one, so I'm going to bring this research forward. It's pretty interesting. At least I think it's interesting. <laughs> um, number two, I want to do a little how-to. I'm, I'm going to talk in detail about our framework today and the, the capability that you could put in your firm to become predictable. I'm not asking you to all of a sudden wake up and have a crystal ball and to be able to predict the future, but there's things that you can do to become predictable. And the last thing I'm gonna do is leave you today with something to think about maybe for the rest of this week. And that is this big myth we have around business building. I'm gonna bust one of them. I won't tell you what it is until the very end. It is kind of keep you in, in tune here. But there's a myth that we're drawn into, we're seduced by, and we're gonna break that with a little bit of data today. So, True Space is the firm that Jamie and I built, the thing that I'm gonna represent with you today. We want to be the beacon for 2.1 million businesses that have between 1 million and 10 million, or five employees and 150 employees. The per perfect juxtaposition to this morning's presentation is us, and this presentation for us, that's the way they designed it. But one of the things I can tell you is if you are, uh, based on this morning's presentation, building a two-person, $1 million business, you're in a much better position to now go into the next step to have less, less fear, less risk, and start building your business toward 10 million. And that's what I'm gonna be able to show you because there's 2.1 million businesses that are there today. The problem is that the businesses that finally take that step, 2.1 million of us get stuck after we take the step. It's, it seems like Captain Obvious, but building a business is much different than starting one. And growing one into the middle market is much different as well. What our research showed us is there is a distinct stage between starting a business and scaling one. We call this true space. And that's what I want to show you is the research that's there because I think I can help become the beacon and help you navigate forward. 
So that's what we want to do today. I think we're going to have a little bit of fun with the data. Anybody in here a data nerd so I can call on you? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, by the way, yeah, that's, that's, not as, <laughs> that's pretty funny in our firm. So, so let me go back and tell you kind of where we started with this whole thing. One week before I stood here three years ago, I stood on the stage of Gallup in Washington, D.C. to present a multi-year study that we had conducted with them to determine, again, what would help companies get to the middle market. Could we do this in a research-based way? So uh, we stood on that stage. We had done four years of qualitative research over, with 150 companies, and we basically hired Gallup to do the quantitative study to say, does, the, does it hold together mathematically? Andrew Hendrickson, who's actually with us today, was with us back then too, is our famous person in the New York Times. So we had a lot of coverage of this research before the nation got shut down. But what's really what we were really looking for, what's keeping these entrepreneurs from reaching the market. And what I get to show you today is some excerpts of that research because it actually is statistically valid. And if you become a predictable business, I'm pretty certain you can create control in your business and you can create wealth. And that's the thing that we saw fleeting when you get in there and you do add more employees and you get stuck in there with debt, financing and other things. This is when your life kind of destroy, gets destroyed by the process. So that's what I'm going to take you through today. It's going to be kind of fun. Here's how it looks. Here's what, here's what we were able to invest in. A long-term study that looked at a lot of things in your business. The most important is what's the delay between decision and effect? Most surveys, as we looked in, in, across the country, are episodic. They look at a point in time. What we wanted to see was the long-term effect of things that happened relative to hiring, firing, capturing a new customer, losing a customer, having a customer not, not support your business. All those dynamics that we were looking at, we were able to study with two qualitative uh, structures. One was ethnography, and the other one was system dynamics. We then took that to Gallup and said, OK, mathematically prove that this works. And that's what we were able to do in this longitudinal study. And the good news is today is I get to take you through a little bit of that structure set. So here's what we discovered. There's 12 systems that exist in your business, whether you use them or not. And it doesn't matter if you're a two-person company or a 200-person company, there are 12 systems. I'll talk about this in just a second. But the, the medical profession has deemed that there's 11 systems in your body, endocrine, digestive, cardiovascular, and so forth. We know with data there's 12 in your business. And what's fascinating to me is whether you use them or not will determine whether you're going to grow to the middle market. When we say middle market, it's getting your business basically to 10 million in revenues. It doesn't mean you have to get there. I just want you to be able to see it and look at your capability relative to that. So the 12 systems basically play out this way, in this, in this structure that we, put, we, we talk about. And this is the, if this was your body, this is the system that we actually put your business into. So let's just take a look at this structure real quickly. On the left side is what we call the Socratic question. The question if this was your human body, I'm using the same framework in a minute with your business, is can we continuously provide oxygen throughout the body? It's basically somewhat rhetorical, if hopefully it, if it's gonna actually happen. It would be the same way in your business. But the way we can look through here is the operating condition or the thing that must actually happen is circulation. And the stock and flow which determine the system is your heart cardiovascular is determined by venous blood, blood pressure viscosity, and lungs by basically converting it with oxygen. That level of specificity I can see in 11 system in, systems in your body, and I'm going to show you three today the three that I think will have the strongest determinant of whether you can become predictable or not. So let me make an assertion real quickly. The things that you're doing in your business on any given day as the founder or the CEO of your business, the thing that I think we finally determined is your job is this, to create the capability to use those 12 systems and to become predictable. Nowhere in there did I say hyper growth, rapid growth, you know, market expansion, any of those things. This is your job right now if you're trying to get a business to build and become scalable. This is ultimately your job. What I'm gonna do in the next few minutes is try to help you determine that that is your job and why it's so important to look at this first versus some of the things that we see, especially in the marketplace today. So what, what are we attempting to predict is, 
is a fallout of what I just told you. So just think about this. Am I, are you really able to predict the future? If I was standing here three years ago and said, you know, we can predict the future, and I didn't realize that two weeks later we were going to literally shut the country down, in no way am I asking you to become that person, to try to predict. I want you to become predictable, which means that we need to understand what happens. And in a business, what you want to become predictable with, in my opinion, is your customer. What are their behaviors? What are their actions? How do they react to you? And most importantly, how can you capture them and keep them? If you can figure out the variables and the systems, which I'm going to show you in a minute, relative to your customer, you can become predictable. You can adapt. You can become versatile. You can find a way to basically predict or, or become predictable in, in the future. So operation control and the eventual valuation of your business in my opinion, is becoming more predictable in forecasting the reactions and actions of your customer. If I were to buy your business today, which eventually value creation is going to be the important part, it's the preamble of what I'm telling you today, I need to know one thing. I need to know that you've proven to me that you know how to capture a high value customer, you know how to support that customer, you know how to keep them for a predictable period of time. That's the whole preamble and assertion behind this idea. So, let's press into this just a little bit. The three systems are this. There's 12 of them. I'm taking these three. We determine this, the operating condition of predictability. But the first one is, what are you assuming? Seems pretty obvious, but I'm going to break it down because assumptions is actually a system. And it's driven by three things. And I'm going to take you through those three things in a second. Second is that we cannot be predictive. In other words, we can't predict the future, but we can actually adapt to it. And lastly, and clearly not least, is how do we build a system that generates revenue relative to those top two. So let's dive into this a little bit. Remember the heart system, the circulatory system I showed you just a few, few minutes ago? What I really want you to do is think the same thing. The Socratic question, are you continuously learning from your business? That's really what I'm asking in this whole construct. I'm going to end with my presentation today with, a, with basically an ask that you become learners of your own business. Operating condition is predictability. The assumption is the system that we're going to look at. And what I want to talk to you about is honesty, goal setting, and trends, because that determines the system of assumptions. So let's just take a peek at this. We run this, we run this ass uh, assessment called the five condition assessment. And in that assessment, I can actually determine whether you're capable of growing or not. We'll talk about this at the very end. But what I really want to think about is that these three, these three questions can come out of that. The first one, are you getting clear feedback? We'll, we'll talk about that as honesty. Second, is that are your goals connected to your capability? And third, did past performance trends teach us about the future? The whole idea on this, on this presentation uh, slide that you're looking at is your business is your teacher. Your business is dying to teach you about the customer if you'll just listen to it. If you'll pay attention to it, if you won't have it lie to you, it'll tell you the truth. And that's really what we're looking for when we look at assumptions. So the first part is, we call this honesty. We can actually measure this in our assessment. Are you really getting clear feedback? And I'll tell you what's interesting to me is that I pretty much suck at this. <laughs> if one of you in the room uh, were in my, on my sales team today, and you were Mr. or Mrs. Positive, and you, everything was great, the customers love what we're selling, the, you know, the future forecast looks terrific. I'd want to listen to you versus somebody who's saying, you know, the product's not very good, they're pushing back a lot, pricing's a real problem. I'm drawn to the positive person. The problem is, is it's, it's, it's affecting and determining my assumptions. And this is something we have to look at from the very beginning, and I can measure that psychometrically and statistically of whether you're actually getting that kind of feedback in your business. The second thing is the trends of your business are the most important indicator of your future. We call this the trailing 12, rolling three, but your past actually will help determine your future if you pay attention to it. It's incredible to me, the study that we've done, how many people basically are not looking at the, at the past patterns of their business and having it inform your future or making it up. The lowest performing companies in our data set are missing forecasts on average of 35% top line forecasting. If you do that for two or three years, you're done because you've overestimated so many things, which I'll talk about in a second. 
but the best ones are getting pretty direct feedback and they're looking at it in trends in their business. Those could be basically capture trends from customers, how long it actually takes to, to, to determine a customer except from a, from a lead to close. All those things are trends in your business that you can look at. So the next system that we're going to look at then is versatility. We put this in after we did, had done the studies because the companies that were becoming the most predictable also had very clear plans of how to get through tough times during the year. It's incredible how many companies look at a straight line forecast or a budget established in December and don't alter it for the entire year. You say, well, we're off budget, we're off forecast, as if that's okay. It's not okay if you're going to become a predictable business. You have to adjust and react and respond to things that are coming at us. So the system we look at are what we call awareness and innovation. And the two Socratic questions that come with this, the first one is, can we course correct throughout the year? And the second one is, what are we doing to innovate relative to that? So I'll get through those in just a second. But awareness is the first and foremost part of this piece of the system. I want you to just think about right now, what are you doing in your business on this day to try to determine if something big or harmful is going to happen in the next quarter, the next three months? Is there anything that you're looking at in your business that can help determine that? You can't drive it forward without thinking this through. So I thought I'd just share a couple things. I was born and raised in Montana. Does anybody know what a bellwether is? By show of hands, I need at least one. <laughs> yes, what's a bellwether? It's a graph. It's a graph? Mm -hmm. Okay, you, back there. Uh, like the, the, the sheep that knows what's going on and brings the sheep in, that weather's coming, that kind of stuff. Right, well both are true, but this is where it started. <laughs> so, um, unfortunately when I went to college uh, in, in Bozeman and I got a job, people reminded me there's more sheep than there are people in the state of Montana. <laughs> um, a, a weather, W-E-T-H-E-R, is a castrated sheep or goat. And it's usually the alpha, it's usually disruptive, it's a little bit like a rooster with a bunch of hens. So they put a bell around its neck, they put it out with the sheep in the field, and when a coyote or some danger comes, it, it, it basically starts running and it rings a bell. It's an alarm, it tells you that something's coming. We hear it in potentially financial terms and others that it's a bellwether, it's an indicator of the future. I'm, uh, the reason, well, first of all, if you remember anything else, you might remember this from my presentation today. <laughs> Honey, guess what? I, I, I learned what a bellwether was today, and it's, it's not what you think. It's not what you think. Um, so, but there are things that we can look at. We run a bulletin at TrueSpace every month, especially last fall, that we're looking at, at trends and things happening in the economy that were so nonsensical. We saw consumer uh, household income at its highest rate in, in years because it was flooded in from some of the stimulus that we had. We had inflation going through the roof and people were talking about um, basically uh, you know, some kind of recession. And we're trying to figure out all those things that were going to happen to our business, but at least we are looking at them. We're way out in front of them in some cases. You might be looking at consumer demand, you might look at seasonality. There's things that you can look at in your business that will greatly determine your assumptions. And it will greatly determine your ability to adapt to the things that are happening. And what I can tell you is that the businesses that are reaching 10 million in revenues today either inadvertently or purposely figured this out. They have things that happen every month and quarter, and they go back and look at this, and it has to be part of the system that you build in your business. But the second part was uh, innovation. And most of us think of innovation because we read books about big companies. They have innovation centers. Um, I did quite a bit of work. I sold a business to, of mine to, to Xerox at the College Research Center. Innovation is like big projects inventions, things like that. That's not what I'm speaking when I say innovation. Remember, I'm in the versatility system that we're building here. It's what can you do with, that's within complete control of your resources today. We saw firms that were getting through tough times by innovating cash collection, innovating sales process, innovating how teams were working together, innovating by getting rid of an office. They're doing all kinds of things to become versatile, which ultimately drives predictability. And that's what I'm encouraging you all to do. Do not sit still. If you're not moving, if you're not assessing the future, you're basically not going to grow predictably. You're going to grow in, in a pretty random way. So let's get into this next one. And it's, it's the last one, but it's the most fun to talk about, and that is customers and revenue. I think almost everybody in here must say, I love customers. I need them. It's how I basically make a living. I need more what, or, 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 or need to keep them longer. But this system, is deeper, it's down in our framework. It's not the first thing you work on. 
you have to do these other things before you can actually become predictable in capturing and keeping a customer. So this system, similar to the ones I've been using, has revenue, and there's two things that determine the system of revenue. It's leads and renewals. And I'm gonna talk through those a little bit. It seems, again, obvious, but in a system, it's not obvious. It's something you actually have to build. So let's just take a look real quickly on the two questions. This is a question, if you were to carve this in your wooden desk, or wherever you have really important things that are not just digital, do we have enough leads today to meet our forecast? You need to know that number, it's an integer. It's not a trend or sort of maybe, it's do I have enough leads? It literally will drive you, your leadership, your team, if you know the answer to that question. It'll also drive you if you don't know because you'll need to find out. And I'm gonna determine, I'm gonna help you determine how you can answer that question here in a second. Second is how many customers must we keep to reach our revenue forecast. It's these two things that are taking basically this entire system of predictability, because remember, becoming predictable means it is all about the customers that you can capture and the ones you can keep. So I wanna take you to a quick study um, that we had in the middle of our ethnography work. We were studying 150 companies at the time. We were three years into this study. And at the time, we had started all, most, almost all the businesses that we were studying were started with us right around two million in revenues. At that time, we had, we had 16 companies, 14 actually finally made it, and 16 that looked like they were gonna make it past 10 million in that three year period of time. This was between 2014 and 2018. So, we, we also had 133 of these companies that were having a lot of trouble finding growth. Really, really struggling. They all packed together. So imagine 100, starting with 150 companies and 80% of them were stuck basically in this period of time. We could only study, we couldn't help. So we went in and on the last day of May in 2017, we asked this question to you. What percent chance do you have of meeting your sales forecast in the second quarter? Assuming you were in a fiscal calendar quarter, you had one month to go to finish the quarter. You had the month of June. What percent chance would you have of meeting your forecast? And it was fascinating because it set in a whole other set of research for us that the 16 companies came back with a couple different questions, but the 133 basically gave us the average of 78% chance, pretty optimistic chance of meeting it. Some were at zero, some were at 100, but we found the mean score at 78%. 133 companies, they finished the second quarter, we go back to them in July, and 7% had made the forecast. So, what did we get back? We got these really fun emails back. Charles, Charles, we just missed it by one customer. They're gonna go meet with the board of directors. Uh, my decision maker was on vacation. We had all kinds of things. And oh, by the way, we're gonna catch it up in the third quarter. No worries, no worries. It's not gonna affect the year, but we missed it. We missed it by a large number. That's not the story. That's just the grind that we all go through every day and we have to keep optimism in our business. But the 16 only came back, believe it or not. There's only 11 of the 16 that responded. They were getting pretty cocky by that time. <laughs> um, and they gave us one of two answers. Just think about this for a second. Zero or 100. Not 70, not 20, not sort of hope. They knew by the last day of May, because they were, be, they were predictable, whether they were going to make it or not. And interestingly enough, uh, I think only half of them said they were going to make it, and almost all of them made it. But they weren't banking on one final deal coming across the line or some hope and prayer that they were going to put out there. And imagine a business that's predictable to that level versus those that were scraping away, trying to get things done in the, in the quarter, trying to get a close made, racing to the end, versus those that a month before, they were already there. And I'll tell you why that's the case. I want to go now answer the question, how do I know do I have enough leads today to determine um, whether I'm gonna meet my forecast? The, the 16 companies knew this information. They knew they needed a certain number of leads to meet the forecast because they knew exactly what their close ratio was, how many leads actually convert to a customer, and they measured it. They measured the trends of that. Remember the trend I was talking about, the trailing 12? They knew the seasonality of it. They knew all that information. They knew how long it actually took to close something from lead to close. And they knew basically the type of customer that they were serving was a high value customer, so they knew their behaviors. 
of how they were actually going to make decisions and how they actually and who had to, had to make the decision. So believe it or not, instead of working on the on the year end close, those that had basically a four month cycle time to close when we went back to them in May, they were already working on September closes. The quarter was back, was past them. They weren't going to be able to impact that because they knew what that cycle time looked like. They knew it because they were predictable. Not that they could predict, but they were predictable. These are the businesses today. One of them is out of Broomfield. It's at 96 million, uh, a, a daughter and mother uh, business that we got connected to early. Um, they started with six, six employees. We've got another one in Nashville that's in the same, the same boat. Because they got that discipline built in, because they became predictable, they can now apply time, capital, and talent more effectively and efficiently. And that's what we want to be able to do in your business. So the second part of this was such a, an eye-opener in our research. The amazing part is most of us that are CEOs and leaders of a business spend an inordinate amount of time on new customers and less than 5% of our total time on keeping the ones we have. I want you to think about that for a second. Our, our, our body of, uh, of work is 2,500 people just like you that we were able to go and look at their time, their calendars, and say, how much time do you spend as a leader of your business making certain you keep the customers that you have? Less than 5% of my time. Comparatively, 20 to 30 percent on that new. We're always looking for the next shiny object, and the best way to become predictable is to keep the ones you have. Now, keep as, a, as, as an interesting thing. We looked at all kinds of customers. Some customers stay with you through a subscription. You can actually measure that. Keep also means promotion. Keep also means basically me coming and helping you get another lead. There's all kinds of things that come from keep. But your best source of a reliable, predictable business is from the customers you have. They teach you. They want to teach you. Your, your business wants to teach you if you, can, if you can use it. So revenue isn't a race. Revenue isn't an episode. Revenue is a system. And it's based on understanding your numbers of capturing a customer, understanding how many leads you need to meet your forecast, and in that understanding the cycle time and, and, the, uh, and the time to close putting that in, pl in place on top of keeping the customers that you have. That's how you become predictable. So, I'm gonna now go into the myth, and then I'm gonna open this up for a few questions. There is a myth that is prevalent in this country, and I want you to think about this for just a second. If you were to go to Google today, right now, don't do it right now, <laughs> stay with me, just a few more minutes, and Google fast business growth. 1 million, 1 billion, 910 million hits come back. We love the idea of fast. If you basically were looking at, at, at other things there, you'd see books. Thousands and thousands and thousands of books. Fast, quick, hyper, accelerate. Why are we drawn to this? Because none of the data supports it. None of my data, none of Inc's data, none of HBR's data supports fast. It's a huge problem in our country today because I think what we hear, what we hear through our filters is instant, mm -hmm. quick, pain-free. There's got to be something in there that gives me this thing that I can do quickly. The number one stakeholder we have to negotiate with when we build our business isn't our employees, it's not our customers, it's not investors, it's our family. They're the, they're the ones that get drawn into this narrative. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you, I've been doing this for 40 years, so I've been married for 40 years. How many times I've negotiated with my children, my grandkids, my wife, and others that I'm just about there. Oh, just a few more months, just a few more months. I read another book on quick, fast. <laughs> so uh, our previous speaker talked about it takes four years to get to a million if you're lucky. Um, to get to 10 million, it takes 12. But only 3% get there. I'm convinced that this is the number one killer of businesses like yours, because when we're in a hurry, we're not learning. And when we're not learning, we can't replicate our business, and we can't replicate, we're wasting time, capital, and time. You know, uh, our buddy, uh, if you think about Benjamin Franklin, he was our first social media champion. Um, I'm a big student, I have Poor Richard's Almanacs and things like that. Haste makes waste, yes, that's, he was the person. Think about this just for a second. I have all these weird things uh, about Johnny Appleseed and, and Ben Franklin and others. 
There were only 10,000 people in the colonies that, that were literate. And his newspaper, um, Poor Richard's Almanac, was in the hands of all 10,000 people. He created his own font, Franklin font, his own distribution, his own printing press. It's pretty amazing, right? But the things he put out there are for real. And that is, haste makes waste, not just in your life, but it'll kill your business. And yet, we promote it, promote it, promote it, promote it. We have complete thesis by people that have gotten lucky, built a business once, and convinced they can do it fast, 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 fast. 12 years to get to 10 million. Only 1% of all businesses formed to make it to 50 million. All businesses, 1%. Think about the odds there. You can, you can change the odds if you'll stop just for a few minutes and start learning from your business. I'm convinced of it. Gary Kunkel was uh, part of our research back when we were working pre gallup He was the chief economist at the Inc. 5000, and they started a process called the Build 100. Uh, Jamie and I were drawn to this research at the very beginning because we thought this is it. We're finally going to have another party that's out looking at companies and how they scale. And unfortunately, what they determined is that the top uh, two-thirds of the Inc. 5000 on any given year don't make it to their fifth year in the Inc. Uh, rate rankings, two-thirds. And what he published back at the time, as you can see, is the only statistical significant predictor of a company's future success. This is from Inc. Magazine, by the way. Um, the steady growth, short, and even long-term bursts mean almost nothing. Their massive database, hundreds of thousands of companies they've had in their data set today, will tell you that. They shut this down because it started to cannibalize the Inc. 5000, which all you have to do to get to the Inc. 5000 is prove a million in revenues um, on, on any given year over three years. So it's all about growth, quick, fast, rapid. The number one player in the Inc. 5000 was the fastest growing firm that year by percentage of revenue. These are the ones that don't survive. What I'm asking you to do is to think about what I told you today, our research construct, and predictability, and start thinking about this. That if you want your business to grow, the fundamental part of this is that you need to learn from it. It will teach you all you need. It's right there waiting for you to pay attention. But you need to slow down and see it. Because when you can replicate what you see, when you can alter what you see, your assumptions become more accurate. Your adaptability and versatility become stronger, more acute. And your revenue becomes more predictable. And that's this whole idea of what we, what we really want to do with this data and what I'm compelling you to do. We're starting to see some pretty amazing companies. Uh, and, uh, if I can just pick on Sergio Real for a second, since you're our fam the famous one. Uh, Andrew Hendrickson, you should talk with him, but he's, he grows the last three years at 50%. That's great learning. That's great application. It's not rapid. It's not hyper. It's none of those things. But it's so amazing when you think about doing that over basically four or five years, and that's what, we're trying to, that's what we're trying to create here, is a different way to see your business, a different way to, to lean into it. So I've got, I think I have seven minutes left, eight minutes left. I would love some questions, and if you don't ask them, I'll ask them of you. So it's, it's that way. Yes? How can you shift a culture from more optimistic to honest feedback? I think our culture right now is very yeah. in the optimistic Oh my gosh. Role. Yeah. <laughs> you can join my therapy group. Uh, I, I don't know if you can start a business without being an optimist. Honestly, pessimists don't start businesses because we, we just talk ourselves out of it if we were. But you have to. And that's why your question's so good. Because if you can't take the truth, you will have really bad assumptions. And what we do is we overestimate. Um, so we saw a number of companies failing because they, they overestimate their growth for the year. For example, in our study set, uh, businesses were growing at around 7% a year on that lower tier, which isn't bad, it's just not great. And we'd see forecasts of 50% growth, 100% growth the next year. And we'd say, why do you have a forecast of 100% growth? Because our investor told us we had to, <laughs> or something happened. But you're not capable of it. So what you do is you go higher against that idea, you, you inflate it, and then you have another thing that we measure in our system, which is credibility. And if your credibility scores go down, your engagement scores go down, and if you do that for two years, people don't want to work for you. So the bottom line is you have to fix it. You have to change what you're doing. You have to reward it. And if you only reward the optimist, the other person will quit telling you the truth, even if they were ready to do it. So I don't have, I don't have the decoder ring for that one because I, I suck at it. Um, I, I can't tell you how great it feels when somebody comes back and tells you you're doing all the right stuff. 
and how awful it is to say our stuff is garbage. And, and granted, that's, those are extremes, and that's not what I'm looking for. But somebody's got to say, you know what, Charles, it takes longer to sell our product. And you've got to start saying it's two months, not one month, or six months, not four, to close a deal. Because that's material to our forecast to becoming predictable. So if you figure that out, please get a hold of me. <laughs> so, yes, I'll get to you in a second. Go ahead. You go first. You go first. Right. So is there some sort of magical way to go from marketing to you want it faster, you want it easier? So right. Well, it's faster, easier, but it's still not the same. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a real common sense. So, so first of all, I'm glad you asked me a question because I want to put it in context. I love hustle, um, grit, uh, uh, intensity. All those things are so important to business building. But none of those say, you know, um, basically go as fast as you can and reward people that are just frenetic. Because that's what we see as a frenzy. Um, businesses that grow, for example, that had maybe a good year that, are, that grew really quickly, they can't tell you why they grew. So how do you replicate it the next year? Just more grit, more, more whatever. So um, what I say you do is you have to put something in motion that helps you become faster in execution but not faster to the point where you're not learning. And I think there's, there's a meter in there someplace to say, what did we learn last month or last quarter that will help us now? And so, again, I, I think fast is okay, but what I, what I worry about is this theme that we've got to plan for, engage in this, this, this hyper stuff that we hear, and we know it doesn't work. There's, there's a, there, you've got to build the capability to get fast. Um, I have a nephew who's at EMT in Portland, um, Oregon, and they, they have a, a circle in the, uh, outside the firehouse. They can get to an accident in five minutes or less in that circle. It basically took two and a half years to build the capability to do that. <laughs> so you don't just get fast because you want to be fast, you create the capability to become fast. Um, but it's a function of learning, and I think that's, what I, that's my message to you all. If you can learn quickly, that's one thing. But if you're not learning and you're just running, you're just doing things, your business is in jeopardy. So, yes? Yeah, Charles, I met you uh, in 2019. I just started my cancer journey. Oh, and these sorry. Things, and these things you said to me that moment carried me through it. And I came out and looked at people that went through chemo. I just got to know I'm a medical miracle. Oh, my God. Congrats. But the words of wisdom you had, I'm sure you know why you're doing I just come up and give you a hug. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I just love you, man. Yeah, that's great news. Thank you. Yeah, when I think about the, the community we built there, it's, it's remarkable. So, yes, sir. Um, I, uh, I'm afraid. Generally, building a company is a, is a sport of building teams and, and people that want to be part of the journey and Correct. having them learn also, right? My question is, is uh, what do you see that's consistent about the companies that do succeed and can predict, like from, a, from an HR standpoint, of people engagement? Yeah, uh, it's, you know, luckily we have Gallup to back this up. Um, fully engaged people that are authentic are as number one. Um, people that love the reason you exist. So it's, it's the reason you exist, we call it your why or your purpose, are much more compelled to tell you when we're off course than those that are just showing up. And it literally is, it stands out, it's the greatest of everything else, is the engagement, authenticity, and connection to the reason you exist as a team. So um, we have an assessment that determines your capability. It's called the five condition assessment. That's what we built with Gallup. Um, one of our investments here at FOCO is to offer that for free to at least three of you. Um, and the funny part was, is that Jamie and I were talking about this beforehand. I, I said uh, three years ago, give me your business card, and that's, does anybody even have a business card anymore? <laughs> um, and we'll pick, we'll pick them. If you have that, great. Uh, but my email is, last name is Fred, so it's pretty simple, C, F-R-E-D, at truespace.com. That's true. T-R-U-E-S-P-A-C-E.com. And I'd love to hear from you anyway. Um, we are deeply invested in this part of the, of, of the state and the country. 
And my hope for all of you is that you do become predictable, that you do get control of your business, and that you create some wealth. So thanks, thanks for being here today.